Welcome to a special edition of Real Christianity. I'm your host, Dale Partridge, and over the past several months, I've had the privilege of interviewing 12 of the top theologians of our time. We discuss everything from apologetics and church history to the biblical family and standing firm on sound doctrine. The objective of this series was to strengthen the theology of listeners and give them the tools they need to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So listen up, focus in, and prepare your mind for volume one of the Theologian series. In this episode of the Theologian series, I interviewed Dr. Tom Askell of Founders Ministries on how to overcome the fear of man. Tom is the author of several books and has served as the pastor of Grace Baptist Church since 1986. His ministry at founders.org has become a robust hub of trusted theological content, podcasts, articles, and videos. And in this interview, Dr. Askell and I are gonna be discussing an issue that confronts all Christians, the fear of man. Today, more than ever, Christians are compromising with the culture and watering down the truth for fear of being hated, politically persecuted, or even canceled. In this episode, Tom offers Christians practical advice for remaining bold in a society that is becoming increasingly more hostile toward biblical Christianity. So guys, grab your Bible and sharpen your pencil because it's time to tune in to another powerful episode of the Theologian series. One. Welcome to the show, Dr. Tom Askell. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you, Dale. Hey, excited to have a discussion about boldness, proclamation of the gospel, things that are happening in the culture today. There are so much, cha- there's so many changes that are going on just in the last year. And I've always said that the church is always better on the defense in terms mm. of the purity. And we always get lazy and spiritually you know, spiritually fat when we're on the offense for especially decades at a time. Um, Excited to have your perspective on this, Tom. And um, we'll talk at the end here to give you some more information about Tom's ministries and the things that he's been doing. Many of you, I'm sure, have already heard of Tom and his work at founders.org. But uh, we're going to dive right in. So, Tom, uh, the Western Church is entering into an era of increased hostility towards Christians and biblical values. We're seeing it everywhere. Um, What's your outlook for the next five years for the church? Uh, Do you expect to see, again, greater aggression? Um, And and if so, what what do you think we're we're looking at? Yeah, I I do, actually, in America. We've we've been blessed so long in so many ways that we've kind of taken it for granted, and we've lost perspective that what we've experienced over 200 plus years here in the United States is really an anomaly in terms of church history. So we have been incredibly favored by God. And what we've begun to experience over the last several years is just a little bit of a taste of what many of our brothers and sisters around the world throughout history have lived with, some of them for all of their lifetime. So yeah, I don't think things are going to get uh, any better in terms of uh, it being Um, opportunity for Christians to live without conflict in our culture, and particularly with our government. I I think our government has revealed itself to be increasingly hostile to Christian churches, and we've seen it in what's happened in this 2020 with California, Nevada, Washington State, where there have been all these policies that have been handed down. Churches have been... uh, told that they can't meet, they're not essential. And I just read an article yesterday about a a church in California that's now facing a, I think it's a $15,000 fine because they've continued to meet week by week over the last few months. And I think those things are going to continue. We've seen it, you know, don't meet, you don't have to meet. Now we got government officials trying to instruct churches on how we can do what we're called to do. Well, don't you know you can meet online and don't you know you can be with God anywhere and these types of things. And it's just, they're, they're trying to, to, they're overreaching Mm -hmm. is what they're doing. And I think we're going to see increased governmental overreach where proper governmental authorities, because God's the one who ordains governments Mm -hmm. and governmental authorities get out of their lane by trying to restrict freedoms 
that they have no business restricting, and especially in the United States. I mean, we're a constitutional republic, and the very First Amendment guarantees our right to practice religion. So this is not something the Constitution gives to us. It's something the Constitution recognizes that is inalienable. It is given to us by God. So I I think churches are going to face increasing challenges about are we going to meet? And are we going to meet according to the way the government says we must meet, not singing, wearing masks, or only limiting the amount of time we have together? Uh, And then beyond that, just not just Christians, but uh, are we going to be forced to have vaccinations? Or are we going to be required to have uh, proof of vaccinations in order to access certain goods and services or travel? Um, All this, I think, is is on the precipice, including even the tax-exempt status that has been recognized as appropriate for churches, religious organizations for the last many decades of our nation's history. So I just think Christians need to gear up, get ready. We, we have probably relied too much on the blessings that we have had that come from our freedoms rather than focusing on those freedoms and trying to contend for them, protect them, and defend them. Yeah, we're seeing basically the fruitfulness or lack thereof of comfortable Christianity or uh, costless Christianity. And we are seeing it in a variety of ways. I think this just, again, um, a lack of clarity of doctrine, a lack of um, of boldness, uh, fear of man that is incredibly strong in the church mm-hmm. right now. Uh, you know, I, I believe, I, I could get this wrong, but Vladimir Lenin said the goal of socialism is communism. And I think about this as we look at this as from a government perspective. Um, I just watched not too long ago um, uh, the founder of Voice of the Martyrs, his documentary called Tortured for Christ, which is mm-hmm. only 60 years ago um, yeah. that we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the communist Romania uh, era. And it's quite amazing how the default government of humanity throughout the ages always comes back to a form of communism. And uh, while we might not specifically be dealing with that now, um, it does seem like those values are on the precipice or on the horizon. Um, And I guess what I should ask you, you, in light of this, in light of the governmental side, in light of the political side, in light of the moral side where you have gender and sexuality at the forefront fighting and pushing the boundaries harder and harder, um, church and religious freedom. You made the statement, Tom, about we need to get prepared. Um, what does that look like? Like, How should we be preparing ourselves as Christians mm. in, the, you know, in these coming months to years for the time that is coming in the next generation? Yeah, well, I don't want to speak in platitudes or sound trite, but it is fundamentally important to get serious about Christ, to really get serious about the faith. Uh, Don't take for granted what it means to repent and believe and to live in repentance and faith. So many of the challenges that we do not navigate well as Christians today, can be traced back to our failure to really understand what it means to live in repentance and faith. We have a gospel. We have a Savior who shed his blood for us. We do not live in condemnation. Because of that, he died for every last one of our sins. Therefore, we really can repent. We really can look honestly at our failures, at our shortcomings, and confess them to God and know that we have a Savior from them. And we can trust Him. We can take God at His word. He gave up His Son for us. And if if God did not withhold His Son for us from us, then He will not withhold any good thing from us. And we ought to believe that, take the promises seriously, and stake our lives on that. More practically, I encourage every Christian to find a good, godly church with courageous leaders and build your life around it. Mm. I mean, that is one of the, the most practical safeguards that I know for Christianity anywhere at any time. It's, it's the prescription that God himself has ordained for Christian growth and discipleship. 
So the church is vitally important. But again, we've seen the idea of the church get watered down. And then in practice, many things going on in the name of church that really uh, extend far beyond what the Bible tells us the church is and is to be and is to do. So find a good, healthy church and build your life around that church. I've also begun to encourage our people and others as well to, to look Think about and look for work opportunities that you can take advantage of without compromising your devotion to Jesus. Mm. And we're having in our church, and I know we're not unique. I've talked to other pastors where uh, some of our folks are having to turn down opportunities. They're not advancing in their companies because to get to the next level requires them to buy into ideologies or at least to sit quietly by why things like transgenderism are being promoted. And they're just refusing to do that. So they're, they're having to uh, uh, rethink their careers. And man, we're encouraging folks to start businesses, look for ways that you can engage in the the mandate that we all have as Christians anyway to subdue the earth and to exercise dominion over it and build companies, build opportunities for work out of your devotion to Christ. And don't, uh, don't just roll over when you see your workplace being infiltrated with these uh, wrong ways of thinking that are trying to demand from you that which belongs only to Jesus. And then another thing I would say is especially important for us to train our children. Amen. Um, Dale, you and I were talking earlier about your catechizing your daughter. Well, praise God for that. We need to be catechizing our children to think biblically about the world and their place in their in this world. We need to teach them from their earliest days what it means to live for Jesus and to understand the cost of taking up the cross and following Christ. And of course, you know, we can't save our children. God God's spirit must do that regenerating work, but he does it through the gospel. And so I I like, uh, I forget who it was that made this analogy that when we teach our children sound doctrine, when we catechize them, it's like we're laying wood on the altar. The fire has to come down from above. We can't do that. But when the fire come, let's do what we can to make sure there's something there to burn. So train your children, prepare them for the world that is coming upon them, and they're going to need every opportunity that we can give them so that they'll be prepared to stand firm. Amen. And I also want to talk about just this. You talked about the idea with children and doctrine. There are so many perversions and distortions of the gospel that I don't think are able to sustain the persecuted, suffering Christian when that time comes. Um, and, you know, the prosperity gospel that just stands in, in stark contrast to the reality of church history and would not sustain someone in a moment of imprisonment or a moment of martyrdom or a moment of, of uh, uh, immense um, social pressure. How do we as Christians really work on getting our doctrine straight again? And, and how do we, you know, what you don't know is you, or you don't know what you don't know. And so what are some resources maybe that we can go and say, we need to get an orthodox view of the gospel because when we understand the gospel in its, in its true biblical form, it is so good that it, it allows us to not have conditional joy. It allows us to have mm-hmm. unconditional joy in any circumstance and will sustain us through whatever suffering. I think about Paul singing hymns on the bottom of the prison floor with his back lashed open. How can you have that joy in a moment like that? And how can we as believers find that joy through sound doctrine? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And uh, I'm a big advocate of historic Orthodox confessions of faith and the Orthodox creeds. And so I encourage Christians and Christian churches to get familiar with those ancient documents that have served the church mm. well. So uh, in the, the more uh, orthodox, older stream, the Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed, uh, the Creed of Chalcedon, just familiarize yourself with them. And we, we recite the Apostles' Creed right now in our church services. Uh, we do that just to remind our people, this is what all Christians everywhere have always believed. Mm. And then a 
confession of faith. Find a, a good confession. Our church uses the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith that was published in 1689. The Westminster Confession of Faith, the Presbyterian document, is a uh, stood the test of time as well. The Savoy Declaration for the Congregationalists, and there are other good confessions of faith. And and then again, catechisms. Man, I mean, I, I wish I had been had grown up being catechized. Me too. You know, I catechized my kids, and that's that's helped me as much as anything. I, I spent a lot of time in formal theological education, but there's nothing that has been more significant to me than catechizing my own children so that you get a mental framework of a systematic understanding of key Bible teachings. So the, the shorter catechism is a wonderful instrument to use. I mean, the children's catechism that introduces that shorter catechism. And, and you know, at Founders, we produced a, a series of booklets for that uh, based on the, the children's catechism, the Baptist version of the shorter catechism, and then a Baptist version of the Heidelberg catechism, which is my favorite catechism Amen. because it, it just is so personal and Christological. So I would encourage all Christians to become familiar with and learn good catechisms and good confessions of faith. I, I think you'll be well served if you give yourself to that exercise. Amen. Yeah, I was telling you, Tom, before we got on our call, I've been doing this with my daughter, and uh, I'll tell you what, there has been some crystallizing of doctrines in that little book that has helped me frame up my doctrine. Um, you know, and, and that's, it, it's just these simple answers is what does it. You go, oh yeah, that's, that's what that's about. <laughs> and it is, it's a, it's right. a wonderful tool, uh, that I recommend many people to do as well. Um, I want to talk about, uh, you know, I think a lot of believers in this generation are concerned with removing fear more than they are concerned with being obedient to God's command of proclamation through the Great Commission. And mm. um, I, I want to know, how do, we, how do we proclaim Christ, the gospel, in the face of fear? Um, and, and how do we do it boldly? How, where do we get rid of the fear of man in the midst of that? Um, because again, I, I always say, and it's not my quote, but, but the Great Commission isn't the Great Suggestion. And so how do we get out there and do this, Tom, without letting fear take over our hearts? Yeah, well, it comes, again, back to Scripture. We need to think biblically about life and death. The fact that we live is because God, and when we die, it will be because of God. He's sovereign over uh, the beginning and the continuation and will be sovereign over the end of life. I think it was George Whitfield that said that a man is immortal until it is his appointed time to die. Amen. So we, we just know that to be true. And the more we know God, the more we take him at his word, the greater confidence we have in him, then the greater will be our ability to trust him as the one who has ordained every one of our days before any of them came to pass. You know, I, I was thinking about this a few weeks ago and was struck by Hebrews chapter 2, uh, where the author says, you know, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of the death, of death that is the devil. And, and he's talking about Jesus there. It says, so Jesus became flesh and blood to destroy the power of death, the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And then it goes on to say, to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Hmm. The fear of death is slavery. And if you live with a fear of death, you're going to live with lifelong slavery. And one of the very purposes for which Jesus died on the cross is to destroy the one who has the power of death and to deliver us from this fear. Uh, later on in that, that uh, same passage, it says that Jesus suffered when he was tempted so that he could be able to help those who are being tempted. Well, tempted to what? Tempted to fear death. Mm. Tempted to live in slavery out of this fear of death. And man, that happens. And there's just something liberating that comes by uh, getting over the, the fact that you're going to die. So much in our culture is designed to keep us from thinking about old age and the inevitability of death, the way of all flesh, the scripture says. 
And, you know, God gives experiences. I've, I've had a couple of experiences that, that have taken me to the brink of death, one just this last year. And I, I have to say that the effects of that, I wouldn't want to choose, I wouldn't choose it. I wouldn't say, that, you know, I want to do it again. But having gone through it, the effects of it, to think, okay, you know, I'm going to die and that's okay. It's okay. Well, it sets you free to really live now. And, you know, the Apostle Paul, says this. And very often when I'm reading scriptures, you know, the Psalms, I'll say, God, show me what you showed David. I, I see what he says here. I want to be able to say that honestly. Well, Philippians 121 is one of those places with Paul where, you know, he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, I want to see that. I want to believe that. I want to be able to say that so that with Paul, I'm not terrified by death. Mm. I mean, it is an enemy. Paul says it's the last enemy, so I'm not going to whitewash it, whitewash it, pretend like it's not serious. It's not fright. It's not frightening. It is serious, but I don't want to be afraid of that frightening thing. One of the things that that helps the thing more than anything else that helps me overcome the fear of man is the fear of God, mm. and. Boy, what a great study that is. I'd encourage everybody to do a study on the fear of God from Scripture. I've got a friend who recently did that, and I think he told me he wound up with over 30 pages of notes Hmm. just from his own uh, diving through Scripture. Well, there's over 150 references in the Bible to the fear of the Lord, either by express statement or description. And Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all those who practice it have a good understanding. Well, I want to understand my life. I want to understand this world. And I can't do that if I'm not fearing God. So study the fear of God. It will set you free from fearing the face of any person. And if we're right about God, if we get that straight, then, you know, what can man do to me? Mm. You know, the Lord is my strength and he's my shield. Another thing we need to do regularly is remember our mission. You know, we, we don't, we have a very clear mission Jesus told us to go make disciples. I mean, it doesn't get much plainer than that. Mm. And so we can do a thousand things, but if we're not doing the one thing that he specifically commissioned us to do before he ascended into heaven, then, um, you know, we need to reexamine those thousand things because they might be crowding out time and energy that should be given to the one thing. And we're never free to shirk our mission. How can we call Jesus Lord and not do the things that he commands us to do, which specifically commands us to make disciples? Uh, Another thing is we need to learn to love our persecutors. I was having a conversation just this morning about this with a dear brother who's having to have a hard conversation, and he doesn't want to have it with the people that he's going to have to talk to because of the way they've treated him. But we need to love our persecutors. Jesus prayed for his persecutors, Mm. Father, forgive them. Stephen prayed for the people stoning him as he heard Jesus pray. And he tells us we're to love even our enemies. Uh, I mean, that's a challenge. It's beyond us doing in our own strength, but it is something God calls us to do. And by his spirit, we can do. Our Lord did it. His faithful disciples throughout history have done it. And we need to pray and not be satisfied until we see his spirit working in us a genuine love for those who, given the opportunity, might take our very lives. Mm. Uh, We realize that they are being duped in ways that it weren't for God's grace. We ourselves would be duped as well. Yeah, I think about, oh, that's just, that's a heavy topic. I mean, I think about what, you know, I I just spent, I don't know how many hundreds of hours studying church history through seminary, but uh, you you Mm. get to see this ongoing trend of martyrdom of these people yeah. that scream out their last words. William Tyndale, uh, you know, pray that the king's eyes may be opened, right? As the king's killing mm. him. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's there's just this heart for that. I, I Church history, I can say, is such a critical discipline um, and a critical study for a, such a time as this. Um, Amen. We, we need to see the encouragement that can come from those in the past who have overcome fear through the grace of God, the power of the Spirit, uh, in the moments of such turmoil. I think it was George Swinock who said, the time is short, the task is large, and the work is important. 
Um, mm. And I have that in our uh, studio, just hanging on the wall, just to remember <laughs> that, hey, we don't got a lot of time. The task is yeah. huge and the work, it's critical. Um, amen. amen. So, um, Tom, how do we pick and choose the issues that we stand for? Uh, we got a culture that's infatuated with identity politics, and tribalism, and, you know, things get very, the, the tip of the spear is getting pretty sharp on where you find unity. And, um, yeah. y- you know, even denominations are getting more starkly different. Wokeness is entering into the church. Uh, the, you have the issues with sexuality that are going on. Um, how do we discern what's worth drawing a line and standing firm in a certain area? Yeah, well, we need to settle at the outset that we're going to stand firm on the Word of God no matter what. And, um, and then I think an equal commitment is to try to live at peace with all men as much as far as it is possible and dependent upon you. <laughs> you know, So try to be a man of peace, but not at the expense of the Word of God. So the Word is our guide. The Word is God's revealed truth for us. We're not going to compromise on that. We're going to be shaped by that. Our minds are going to be renewed by that. And then we, we can't discount providence. Uh, there's so many battles, as you said. There's so many things that, that are going on today that if, if you just wanted to spend all your time fighting, you could do that as a Christian, and you could find legitimate objects of your opposition because they're inside the church, they're outside the church. But I do believe that providence is a significant determiner of what battle to fight. I've had brothers say to me, you know, things I've been engaged in pretty strongly and and polemically, they just said, it's not my battle. Mm. And I get that. I don't fault them for that. You know, some of them are in different countries and different settings and uh, contexts that it's not what they have to take up at this time. But what all of us must be prepared to do is to stand firm in the evil day when the fight comes to us. You know, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm number 120. It's a brief psalm, and the, the, the psalmist at the end, you know, he's lamenting the fact that he's faced opposition and there's persecution. There are people that do evil to him, and he says, I am a man of peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Mm. And so you can have peace if you just don't speak. But God's people are not free not to speak what God has said or to remain silent in the face of our Lord and Savior being uh, denigrated Mm. by word or deed. We've got to to obey God rather than men. We've got to be willing to speak. And, And then I think a principle I've tried to operate on is that wherever and whenever the truth is being attacked, I have some obligation to speak given opportunity. I'm not going to have opportunity always. You know, there'd be some things beyond my uh, influence and beyond my ability, but I have a responsibility and I want to own that responsibility. The more important the truth under attack, the quicker ought to be my response. And so if somebody's um, making light of or dismissing areas that are disputed areas of, of Christian teaching. You see this sometimes happen with eschatology. Well, eschatology is important, and I'm not going to say it's unimportant just simply because good men disagree about it, but I'm going to not be as quick to come after those areas of disagreement in that realm as I am on Christology. Mm. So when someone says, you know, well, Jesus Christ really isn't God, he's just a creature, well, I'm going to be quicker, stronger to address that because now you're touching upon something that if you get wrong will take you to hell Mm. and you will miss God completely. Mm. Yeah, I think about, there's an article I read many years ago now. It was uh, by Al Mohler who wrote about um, theological triage and the idea of having level one issues, level two issues, and level three issues. I think it's critical. I think also what you said, Tom, is just being willing to not keep your silence in the face of your Lord being um, diminished in any way. I, I There's a right. story just as we were talking about the worm brands in the uh, Tortured for Christ documentary. His mm-hmm. wife, Sabina, wrote a book uh, called The Pastor's Wife. And she talks about a section in there 
that the communists were were cursing Christ on a stage, and there was a crowd of them standing around. And she looked at her husband, Richard, and said, are you going to say something? And he says, if I say something, you won't have a husband. And she responds to him, I don't need a coward as a husband. Speak up. And you yeah. think about those moments and you go, okay. Um, those those moments, we, we are not far from those moments in a conversation with just about anyone today. Right. You know. No, you're exactly right. And, and it's become far too common for those who know better to be silent mm. and to look the other way because it is going to bring all kinds of difficulty if you speak, if you stand. But consequences belong to God. And, and if we can get that straight, you know, our, our responsibility is to do our duty, to live well, to die. God will take care of consequences. And if we can get that clear and remember that, then whether we live or die, it doesn't really matter as long as God gets the glory that is rightly His. Amen. Yeah, just resting in the reality of just you just be faithful. Let the results go to God. Yeah. I want to talk just as we get ready to close here. We have a couple more questions, but um, we talked a little bit about church history. Um, when you when you look through the history of the church, Tom, who do you look to as mentors, pastoral figures, teachers, uh, men that you've you've thought, wow, if I could just have a little bit of that, what they had. Mm. Um, who are those figures in your life? And, uh, you know, which books maybe could we consider picking up or, or must-reads of biographies of great saints and pastors throughout church history? Yeah, well, those are... Those are great questions, and I do. I've, I've benefited so much from those who've gone before, and I'm I'm thankful for teachers that have introduced me to our heritage as Christians. Uh, I, I I remember learning about Athanasius uh, long ago, you know, who was a fourth century bishop of Alexandria, and just li- his life was just tumultuous. I think he was exiled five times, and. I think it was like 40, 45 years that he served as bishop, and 17 of those years he was in exile. And so it was, you know, Athanasius against the world. That was the motto that attended his life because the world, it seemed like he was the only one standing uh, for solid Christology at times when he was being exiled. So learning from him and and being willing to stand firm like he did has been uh, a great encouragement to me. And then certainly Martin Luther, you know, who, who can't, love and doesn't love Luther to see what he did when to take the stands he took meant he was bringing down on his head, not just excommunication, but uh, a ban politically that put a price on his head. But he did so because as he popularly said, you know, my conscience is captured to the word of God. Here I stand. I can't do anything else. There's a, you know, the, the um, Roland Baton's little, popular biography of Luther is really good. And I encourage everybody to read it because it is so accessible, but then you can read Luther himself and his bondage of the will, Mm -hmm. which is a debate, a literary debate uh, over the uh, issue of the the freedom of the will, predestination and the sovereignty of God with uh, Erasmus. That is a, I think that's the most important book in the 16th century, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And in that, you get the flavor of Luther's dogmatism and determination not to back up. Now, Luther did some things that we can learn from that you don't, we don't want to emulate because we see how he got untethered at points. But I, I look at that and I think, well, a lesser man than Luther couldn't have done what he did, and it took great courage for him to stand. I mean, the martyrs, that some of which you've already mentioned, the you know, Fox's Book of Martyrs, has been a, a great encouragement uh, to me through the years too mm-hmm. to hear about these people who to us today are largely forgotten, who went to the stake or died by having their heads taken off their shoulders or died in prison because of their commitment to Christ and just realizing that we we have a noble heritage of men and women who refuse to bow the knee to anyone but the Lord Jesus. Uh, there's a man I met <clears throat> years ago. You, you mentioned Richard Wormbrand. He was an associate of, of Wormbrand's. His name's Joseph Son, 
And I, I don't know if he's still alive or not. He's elderly if he's still alive. But uh, he also was a Romanian pastor, a Baptist pastor, was imprisoned, arrested multiple times. Um, his ministry went throughout Romania under Ceausescu uh, at, at great cost. And so there were cassette tapes of his sermons in those days, and they spread throughout the, the whole nation. He tells the story of uh, one time being accosted. There's a price on his head, and so the secret police accost him on the street and pull a gun on him, and they, they say, you know, you're Joseph Son, so, you know, we could shoot you on the street and uh, there's a reward on your head. And he, and he said, well, that's true. He said, you could uh, shoot me. He said, killing me is your greatest weapon. He says, but as you know, he said, my sermons have spread all throughout Romania and dying is my greatest weapon. Because if I die, the people who have my tapes and who will know of my ministry will see that I really do believe what I have taught, and it will multiply the effectiveness of my ministry. So he said, your greatest weapon is killing me. My greatest weapon is dying. If you use your weapon, you will force me to use mine. Wow. And he said the guy just kind of freaked out and put his gun away and left. But he, he, had, he overcame a fear of dying. He was willing to die. And he wrote a book, I think it was his dissertation at Oxford on martyrdom. I forget the exact name of it, but it got published. And, and in that book, there's some wonderful insights into the mentality that we need to have um, as Christians and, and those who, who have gone before us who have shed their blood for the cause of Christ, for his gospel, that they've paved the way for us that we're to walk in. But, you know, it's not just not just people in history. I mean, they're, they're contemporary people as well, Christians right now yeah. who are, uh, are worthy of knowing and emulating. I mean, John MacArthur, uh, people have criticized him so much in 2020 because of his stand and leading his church to reopen and stay open. And, um, I mean, he's a hero. Mm-hmm. He, you might not agree with every all the way he did it and all the things he said, but can we at least as Christians applaud his courage in standing in the face of opposition from the government and saying, no, we're going to do what Christ has called us to do as a church. And Rob McCoy is another pastor out in California that I've gotten to know this last year who went to trial and they brought him to to trial because they told him they're going to fine him. I think they were fining him like $500 a service, $1,500 a a week if they didn't shut their church. And I don't know what the fines are up to now, but he, he went and he testified in court. He looked at the judge. He said, I, Your Honor, I know you don't want to be here. He said, I don't want to be here. He said, We respect authority. He said, But we're under uh, a, a greater authority to Jesus Christ, and we cannot compromise. You know, our brothers and sisters in China, I think of Wang Yi, uh, the, the Chinese pastor who in late 2019 was arrested uh, because of his commitment to the gospel, he anticipated it. So he wrote a series of articles for his church, you know, that when I'm arrested, this is how you are to live. You're not to compromise. And he's, he's been sentenced to nine years. I guess he's, you know, in the midst of that nine year sentence. I, I've been privileged to sit down and, and share meals with men in China who one of them, 25 years in prison, another 17 years in prison. I, I got to meet Samuel Lamb for over 20 years, was persecuted, beaten in prison uh, as a, a martyr because he suffered for the sake of Christ. And every time I've come away from those uh, meetings, those conversations, those meals, and I just thought, man, I'm not worthy to even tie the shoes of these mm-hmm. men who've loved Jesus at great cost. And yet I've been so challenged and encouraged because every one of those men have spoken with joy. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not bitter, they're not complaining, they're full of joy at what Christ has done for them and that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. So, boy, learn what you can about those who have blood mixed with their convictions. Mm. Yeah, and this is the time to do it. It's that We, again, have been so blessed for so long with such a easy Christianity um, mm-hmm. that take advantage of this moment to have that study, have that look at scripture. I think about, you know, you said earlier, the creeds, 
I mean, the people didn't have Bibles to carry around, especially not, they didn't have them on their phones. They memorized these creeds because if they were imprisoned, they would have these core essential truths of the gospel in their hearts and minds that they could recite to themselves. Um, And again, it's a weird thing to talk about, but there's a possibility that we may live Mm -hmm. through a season just like that. Um, Amen. In closing here, Tom, you know, tell us a little bit about your ministry. Um, How can we find you? How can we support you? You guys do quite a bit, so you can take a minute to tell uh, us how we can get involved and what you're doing. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Uh, Founders Ministries began literally in a prayer meeting in 1982. A group of seven men got together outside Dallas in a hotel room. We spent the day in prayer, reading scriptures, singing uh, together, and thinking of what we could do to try to... um, uh, be useful in the kingdom of God to encourage people to take God's word seriously. And out of that prayer meeting began what we call the Founders Conference, and from that conference began what we now call Founders Ministries. So we're committed to the recovery of the gospel, the reformation of local churches. We want to see the gospel receive its pride of place in the life of every Christian, in the life of every church. And we want to see churches ordered according to Scripture. And that's really our burden. So we try to resource and and help pastors and church leaders and other serious-minded Christians to understand what's involved in that. What is the gospel? How does it work? What is the Christian teaching surrounding uh, the gospel? What does the Bible say about any number of subjects? And then how do we live together as churches? So we have conferences. We have an annual conference uh, each year in January in Southwest Florida. We have regional conferences. We have had pastors fraternals. We publish books. We have a quarterly journal that comes out, the Founders Journal, that you can access for free online. Uh, We have a a podcast, the Sword in the Trial podcast, that my associate, pastor, and I, Jared Longshore, uh, host. We deal with all kind of cultural, theological issues uh, every week. We've put out by what standard as a, uh, a documentary to address some of the things going on in our culture, in our churches in the last few years, particularly pertaining to the critical social justice movement. We're in the midst now of producing a series of, of small documentaries called Wield the Sword. And so we've got a few of those already available. They're available on Amazon Prime. You can just look up Wield the Sword there. You'll see uh, one on the scripture in the world. You'll see one on uh, manhood and womanhood. Uh, We've got uh, others on aesthetics and metaphysics and vocation that are coming out. So we're just going to be doing this. We've got a series of 15 of these small documentaries that we're producing and trying to get out on Amazon Prime in a timely fashion. A a, a new... um, effort that we've just announced and are undertaking is called the Institute of Public Theology, which is going to be a course of training for pastors and pastoral candidates and for others who are interested in learning theology, the biblical languages, the biblical exegesis, philosophy, and apologetics, polemics, all with a view to taking a stand in the public Mm. square. So we realize that the kind of... um, privatized pietism that has been so popular for so long in American Christianity is uh, simply not going to serve the church at all in the days which we are in and the days which we are facing. So we are we started this Institute of Public Theology to try to think through Christian life and ministry with a view to the increasingly hostile world which we live in, particularly in the United States, but we think that it'll be useful uh, in uh, countries around the world that are not the United States as well. And then finally, let me just say that uh, Jared Longshore and I have recently published a book called Strong and Courageous, uh, How to Stand Firm in the Midst of America's New Mm. Religion looking at the paganism that has arisen in our nation and what does Christian faithfulness look like in the face of that new religion. So you can access all of this at founders.org. And we have tons of resources for free. We publish articles every week, uh, several times a week, usually uh, five or 10 articles will go up on our website each week that you can access for free and uh, see what other ministries are available that might be useful to you. Amen. And I'll tell you guys, just a few resources that have been helpful to me um, is the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith in Modern English 
So it's a very short book. I mean, what, 50 pages maybe. And it's a great resource if you've never read uh, a statement of faith, like a comprehensive statement of faith, like the Westminster Confession or the 1689. It's a really great way in modern English to read it, check it out, understand, wow, that that's what Orthodox Christianity is. And um, it's backed up with scripture and, and uh, a good understanding of those creeds and confessions. It's a great tool. Another thing I talked about earlier was uh, I took my I take my children through their Truth and Grace series. It's a three book series for like little kids, like uh, you know 10, 10 year olds, and then like up to you know twelve to fourteen year old kids. And they get a little bit more complex. The 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 number three book is yeah, it's harder to <laughs> to memorize all those uh, answers on that catechism. But they're great thin little books and a great resource. Again, um, I'm on their website right now as we're talking. It's just at founders.org. And so, yeah, big proponent of what you guys are doing over there, Tom. Thank you for being faithful uh, in the ministry there. And Tom, thanks for joining us today. Well, it's been my privilege to be with you, Dale. I'm grateful for what you're doing and look forward to meeting you personally one day. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for listening to the Theologian series. And we're going to have several more of these incredible interviews with other theologians coming up in the following months. Thank you for listening to this special edition of Real Christianity. This podcast is a 100% listener-supported audio ministry of Relearn.org. Visit Relearn.org for a library of theological resources, articles, podcasts, and videos to strengthen your biblical literacy and support your study of God's Word. For those interested in supporting our ministry, you can make a tax-deductible donation at Relearn.org forward slash donate. Again, my name is Dale Partridge, and we're excited to have you back next week for another episode of Real Christianity.